You've heard the songs, you've seen the passion. Every other tournament, England is rocked by the frenzy of its coming home. But it never does. For the three lions, trophies are the dad who went for milk and never returned since 1966. It's always been agonizing misses and painful defeats, regardless of who's at the helm or who they take to the competition. Given England's sheer amount of talent over the years, not only is it a ridiculous feat that they haven't managed a trophy in decades, but underdogs have won the competition ahead of them. You only need to go back to 2004 to find Greece sending bookmakers to the cleaners by pulling a 2016 Leicester City. But this isn't about the underdogs. It's about a recurring favorite that never seems to live up to its potential. That begs the question, why? It's been almost 60 years since England last lifted a trophy. Well, at least one that matters. The best description of the last half century is an unhealthy pattern of hope turning to fear, despair, sadness, and cold-hearted indignation. Worst of all, the cycle never ends. It's rinse and repeat for every tournament from the Euros to the World Cup. England fans only get two years of peace before the three Lions take their emotions to the cleaners again and again without remorse. The year 1966 must have felt like Christmas. England weren't just a great team, they were world beaters. But ever since, that miracle has been rarer than an ex-Stoke City striker playing for Real Madrid. Instead, it made way for a rather unfortunate theme. Refereeing injustice, penalty shootouts, hurtful misses, qualification problems, and the three lions simply being put to sleep by better opponents. An argument can also be made about the English FA's decision for a manager, the manager's competence in using players, and the players themselves. We'll get to all that soon, but first, let's turn back the clock. England have never won the Euros. Yes, they've won the World Cup once, but they're hardly firm favorites to win in the continental competition. Of course, supposed experts tout them to lift the elusive trophy every year, and they have come close on several occasions. But the fact remains that the three lines' history in the Euros has been nothing short of criminally underwhelming. There have been third-place finishes and a runner-up spot as recently as 2021. But besides that, England have either failed to qualify, struggled to beat underdog opponents, or buckled under the pressure when going toe-to-toe -to -toe with similarly ranked opponents. Why? Let's focus on the real issues, which began with the core philosophy that the English team is built around. The best way to describe why England have failed to live up to its potential in the Euros isn't far-fetched. It's simply a victim of its history. The British codified the beautiful game as we know it. That's helped their domination of the sport, as the country continues to churn out superstars every decade like FIFA regens. They've also managed to put together one of the richest, most dominant leagues on the planet. It's why even mid-table teams in the Premier League have no problems poaching some of the best managerial or playing talents anywhere else in the world. For instance, Unai Emery went from coaching PSG to a struggling Arsenal, and then to an Aston Villa side that's been mid-table mediocrity and relegation bound for the better part of the last decade. Tottenham somehow got their trophy averse pause on serial winners like Jose Mourinho and Antonio Conte. And recently, West Ham appointed Julen Lopetegui, who used to coach Real Madrid and Spain. You've got to hand it to the English, they sure dominate the sport. However, they haven't been so forthcoming about reinventing the sport to keep it entertaining, fresh, and thrilling as we know it. The real innovators are from Central Europe and South America. The English Premier League, touted as the best, most competitive football league, has never been conquered by an English coach, not even once in its history. But in 1966, England got it right for a minute. They finally pieced two and two together and made sense of the bigger picture. But as Glenn Hoddle said, we took a step back and admired ourselves and stood still. They stood still. The only thing worse than failing is not realizing you're not even trying to succeed. If lagging in tactical and technical evolution isn't bad enough, England have simply been too easy to pick apart. We saw this in the 2006 World Cup when attention turned to Ronaldo and Rooney spat on the field in a match that Portugal eventually won on penalties. Or how Andrea Pirlo punked Joe Hart with a panenka at the 2012 Euros. There are always those moments before disaster when it becomes clear as day that whatever glue was holding the team together was starting to come undone. 
And all the opponents need to do to exploit this loophole is to employ some nous and save, something a team of superstars like the Three Lions should be immune to or able to counteract. In 2016, their undoing was even more trivial, a selection dilemma. Who ought to show up at the Euros, Rooney, Vardy or Kane? In what world should that have ever been a question? The Manchester United man was on the wrong side of 30, but not in a good way. While his age mate Cristiano Ronaldo was still tearing it up for Los Blancos, Rooney was in his twilight years. His influence on the team was waning, as was his impact on the pitch. A year later, he was allowed to leave United on a free. Yet, he was causing a selection crisis over Jamie Vardy, who just shocked the world with Leicester City, and Harry Kane, who was consistently challenging for the golden boot. That brings us to the next problem, the Three Lions' preference for team balance over innovation or drive. Put simply, they'd rather things remain unchanged than dare to try and fail. Imagine an English forward lineup with the doggedness of Kane or the aggressiveness of Vardy, supplied by the youthful exuberance of an on-fire Delhi Alley. They may not have won the Euros, but they'd have done more than keel over and show their belly. You'd think all these years later that England would have learned a few lessons or identified a problem, but it's the same poor choices regardless of who's at the reins. The team has no identity beyond its structure and the need to preserve balance. Graham Taylor said it best, We've become trapped between our traditional game and feeling that, at international level, we should play a more refined style. And so, we have a team that's got all the resources to be champions or at least fierce challengers, yet continues to look over its shoulder and convince itself that this year is its year, while time continues to fly by. Something must give or nothing will come. England's golden generation consisted of world-class stars who played for the best teams in the world and constantly played in premier competitions like the Champions League. Many of these stars made their clubs, typically Manchester United, Chelsea, Arsenal and Liverpool, dominant both in the league and European competitions. Yet somehow, despite constantly competing for and winning loads of trophies at club level, a team that comprises the likes of Gerrard, Lampard, Beckham, Scholes, Rooney, Terry, Ferdinand, Owen, Cole, Neville and more finished without a single trophy to their name. The quality is enough to make any side a recurring favourite to win any competition, and the three lines were, but it never did them any good. There are plenty of reasons why England's golden generation failed, and everyone and their neighbour's dog have a reason or two to chuck it up to. But here are some middle grounds we can all agree to. First up is the wonderful disaster that is the English hype. Never has there been a nation that hypes its talents more than England. A player needs only to show that they have a morsel of talent to be slapped with the ridiculous price tag. So, you can imagine the hype surrounding a perceived golden generation of superstars who'd more than proved they were capable of getting the job done in major tournaments. Every one of those aforementioned players won major trophies for their club before, and some even went for doubles and trebles. There was talent in that squad all right. But the problem with hype is that it also comes with weighty expectations. That's why we say people fail to live up to the hype, because hype is just a romanticized word for sky-high expectations. We're not saying nothing should have been expected of that crop of players. They're not exempt from expectations at club level either. But the problem with the English media is that the only thing that rivals its hype is its criticisms. You only need to look back at the last five years to see how the media has turned on its darlings, from Bukayo Saka to Jadon Sancho to Marcus Rashford to Harry Maguire. We're not saying it's the media's doing, but they certainly didn't help. It doesn't matter how well you performed last time, because you're always one poor showing away from utter denigration. Rashford had the best season of his career last year. Unfortunately, this season he's been underwhelming. Every move he's made has been met with criticism. God forbid the man who single-handedly saw that kids were fed during the pandemic go out to party and unwind. And this is a recurring theme. So, imagine how the golden generation must have gone into every match knowing that they were one slip up away from being told by clueless fans and yellow journalism pages masquerading as credible sports papers that they should have become plumbers instead. If you want proof, look no further than the 2010 World Cup, when Rooney went from being a top scorer in the qualifiers to not scoring a single goal in the tournament. 
or how the media and fans turned on Sancho, Saka and Rashford with criticisms and abuse that cost England the Euros in 2021. The next reason for the Golden Generation's failure is a combination of factors rolled into one. At some point, they just stopped caring. That's down to three things. Club rivalries, huge egos and penalty crisis. Every heavy hitter from that generation was torn between the four big clubs in the league. Sure, off the field some of them were good friends, but on the pitch their mindsets are mostly tuned to playing against each other, not together. As professionals, we can argue that they know better than to let it get in the way. But that's where the problem of ego takes over because if you played for United, Chelsea or Liverpool, you had a rich history of winning both domestically and abroad to think an Arsenal player was on your level. And given you already know the media and fans would turn on you anyway, you sort of mentally resigned to the fate that the only thing that mattered was what you did at club level. And you weren't wrong, because if left to the national team, you'd go down as the most mediocre player ever to partake in the beautiful game. That's not held by the fact that every time these players failed to win a match in regular time, they may have struggled to shake the fact that England have a history of bottling penalties. Of course, they think they'll be better. But the thing with penalties is that it's more about a player against themselves than said player against a goalie. Finally, the third biggest reason for the failure of England's golden generation is managerial decisions. Where do you begin with the comedy of errors that the English FA has hired to lead its promising squad to bigger and better things? You can argue that Gareth Southgate has been the better of the bunch, but we don't see a World Cup medal in his closet. So, even if he looks better compared to the current crop that has managed the three Lions right now, he's the best of a bad bunch, which is hardly a compliment. Here are some of the managers who coached England in the last two decades. Sven Goran Eriksson, Steve McLaren, Roy Hodgson, Fabio Capello, Gareth Southgate. Of this lot, Sven Goran Eriksson and Fabio Capello are the most decorated managers with European trophies under their belts, but neither lasted on the job. For Eriksson, fans didn't think he was convincing on the touchlines because he was calm rather than animated. Yeah, shame on the man for not being a nuisance, despite taking the three lines to a quarter-final in his first year on the job. Then came Fabio Capello in 2010, and this time the problem was that he didn't feed the players massive egos. There was just no winning with them. And the times the English FA has relied on its crop of talent to lead the three lines, it's always been underwhelming. Roy Hodgson may have once been a Liverpool manager, and Steve McLaren may be at Manchester United now. Still, their only experience in any top competition was as runners-up, and they never quite exceeded that for the rest of their careers. Not to mention, Southgate is a failed club coach. He managed to flunk out of three different clubs, and his best honor was a Manager of the Month award. They say managing a club is more difficult than managing a country. While that may be true, it doesn't justify hiring anyone who passes a breathalyzer test. Southgate's tactics are archaic at best and uninformed at worst. The three Lions have a sleuth of attacking talent and a solid defensive base. For one, Anyone with two working brain cells can tell Pickford's hardly the talent you want between your net. But even when challengers like Nick Pope, Aaron Ramsdale and Dean Henderson hit some of their best forms, Southgate persisted with the mid-table shot-stopper. They say some players play better at their national teams than for their clubs, but Pickford isn't killing it either way. He's had remote patches of brilliance, don't be mistaken, but he's hardly consistent enough for it to matter. Here's another example. A sensible coach would know to play Foden and Saka on both wings at the same time, rather than having them compete for the same spot and give Bellingham free reign to split the attack with Kane, who's great at building play and creating chances. But you just know it's going to be more of the same with Southgate. The Los Blancos man will play as a midfielder with defensive duties, like any other person he's paired with in midfield. This isn't a video to call Southgate a horrible manager, but to show that nothing's quite changed with the three Lions. The more the squad appears to change, the more it stays the same. So, now for the big question, will Southgate win it this time? They may, they may not. Most experts think this is England's ultimate chance, and if they don't win it now with this team of players, they never will. We've been here before with an even more talented crop of players and an even better manager at the wheel. The team is young, 
and bustling with talent in every area. If it's back to trusting the balance of the team over anything else and failing to dare to succeed, the only thing coming home will be the vicious cycle of despair until the next World Cup two years from now. What do you think? Will England go all the way this time? Let us know below and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this one.